So let's talk for a moment about the veteran student versus the traditional uh, student. Uh, I think you, you have some inkling of this, but let's just kind of put it out on the table. So generally, the vets are older, possibly you know more mature. Uh, they bring to the table a different perspective because they've been out you know all across the globe um, and have some different life experiences to share. Um, Typically, they have spouses and family responsibilities that they've got to be dealing with as they reintegrate back into uh, our society and, and uh, school. And uh, I was interviewed a few months back by the Seattle Times, and the first question out of the reporter's mouth was, oh, so these veterans get the gravy training with these GI benefits. And I'm like, um, not so fast. Okay, so yeah, they get their books covered for the most part, depending on what chapter benefits they have. Um, they get a living stipend, but their living stipend is about $1,600. Um, it is the max. Um, they have their tuition covered, um, but typically they, they only walk into the equation with 36 months of benefit. And it's gonna take them at least four years, because like in our situation, when they test in for math, for example, they've got about four math classes that they have to take before they can actually take college level math. You know, so all that adds into the equation. So I wanted to spell any myth about the GI benefits or uh, other the gravy train. Um, the other part of it is they may be in the National Guard Reserve. We don't have a very big active duty component here in this area because we don't have an active duty base. Okay. And please stop me at any time, or stop any of us at any time if you've got a question. So here's the strengths that vets bring to the table. Um, one of the things that the State Board for our community colleges, they say that community colleges are an incubator for vets to make this transition, and I would agree. I, I oftentimes push veterans towards WSUV because, I, you know, from my experience, WSUV has the, what I call the look and the feel of a community college. You typically have a little bit older student. Um, you don't have dormitories, you know, so you don't have that element. You know, it's a much smaller school, so you guys get to know them. They don't slip through the cracks, those sorts of issues. So they walk into the equation, most often, with great organizational skills, great communication skills, they tend to be resilient and self-confident. Uh, they typically have good leadership skills. Uh, compared to their other students, they have a much stronger work ethic. And then bottom line is they have a lot of discipline. However, and this is a footstop, however, if they are experiencing invisible wounds, that will take them take all these strengths and possibly turn them into weaknesses, okay? Now, what I'm not saying is that that's true of every veteran, okay? Before I hand the uh, stage off to Mandy, I want, I want to talk about my own experience a little quick. You know, I, I retired from the Air Force after 26 and a half years. Um, when, I, when I stepped off active duty, I did not perceive that I had any of these invisible wounds. Um, part of that was because, you know, the mission of the Air Force. Um, we are always, well, not always, typically we're behind enemy lines, we're sending our airplanes out to do our bidding and then they come back to a home station that's, you know, uh, protected. And it wasn't until I took this job and was exposed to this book called What It's Like to Go to War um, that I started realizing that I, too, had some invisible wounds that I was ignoring, stuffing, you know, not dealing with. Um, the, the proposition of this book is, as a country, we do an incredible job of preparing our men and women to go off and prosecute war in, in a technical sense. We have done a very poor job, and we're getting much better at this, you know, dealing with this, uh, the psyche piece of what happens when you go off and you do some of these horrible things. So, Mandy, I'm going to go ahead and 
hand it off to you. Well, welcome. Thanks for sitting in this room when it's amazing outside. <laughs> I just really want to thank you for that. Uh, I know it's hard. It's hard for me to walk in the building with it. It was so beautiful out there. Uh, really quickly, I just want to tell you a little bit about who I am and uh, what we do at the Vet Center. So the Vet Center is actually part of the VA. We are not part of the VA Medical Center. We are our own little separate leg, if you will of the VA and we've been around since the late 70s. We were started by Vietnam veterans. They were looking for a safe place to talk about their war experiences and Vietnam veterans being the amazing advocates that they are then went up through Congress and said hey this needs to be available across the country. It needs to be for all Vietnam veterans to come and have a safe place to talk and so there's currently 300 vet centers across the nation. So uh, what we do is readjustment counseling. We are primarily social workers, counselors, psychologists. We don't do any kind of medication. We just do individual and group therapy for veterans who've been to combat, veterans who've experienced military sexual trauma, and we also provide grief and bereavement counseling for family members who lose someone on active duty. So that's kind of a little bit about the Vet Center and what we do. So. I've just got a couple slides today to just kind of introduce you a little bit to veterans and hopefully give you something more that you didn't know uh, or refresh the things that you maybe already did. So by all means, interrupt me and if you have a question or something pops into your mind. So Tim mentioned some of the strengths and I do want to reiterate that the veterans in the classroom, most of the time they're here because either the skill that the military gave them is no longer working, or in some cases, there's really not a good transition in the civilian world. It's hard to be an infantryman and, and go, you know, hop into the next great career field. It's just the reality of it. So a lot of times, veterans are coming in and they're wanting to better themselves uh, because they either transitioned out due to retirement, they're medically disabled, uh, or the military is downsizing and they're no longer necessary in that field. So for whatever the reason it is, most of the time they're here because they want to be here. It's those rare cases that you might see that somebody's going, well, I have to feed my family and the only way I can get money is the GI Bill. And that does happen, but it's a very, very rare case. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the at-risk barriers. Uh, oftentimes, you might find that veterans are disconnected from their classmates. Oftentimes, the military gives us this amazing sense of community. The person next to me, all around me, we have the same mission. So we don't really have to talk about that much because we're headed in the same direction. And now I'm all of a sudden in this classroom with all these people going in all of these different directions. And it's easier to just stay in my own little pocket and isolate. So that's one of the things that can come up frequently. Also, emotional distress. One of the things that our military does not do, shockingly, is provide really good coping skills with stress. They teach how to focus on the mission and keep moving forward and ignore. My favorite saying is, pain is weakness leaving the body. <laughs> well, that works great in the infantry, but that's not really good when you actually need to listen to your body because something's wrong. So uh, that's just kind of one of those great examples of being numb to what's happening with you, and, and that often happens with the military as well. Financial stress. Oftentimes, Tim mentioned families. It's not just it's not just you that you're worried about. You've got two, three, four kids and a spouse, and before you were living on post, and now you're back here, and you've got to live with your mom and dad. <coughs> that's stressful and now you got to find enough money to make sure that everything's going so even though the GI Bill is there uh, it oftentimes dependent on how long you served how many classes you're taking how many how many days of this month were you in class and, and all of those things are variable so that adds a lot of stress on top of it uh, difficulty with focus a lot of veterans especially the Iraq and Afghanistan veterans struggle with TBI, 
Have you all heard that term, TBI, traumatic brain injury? I think we'll talk about it more in the 201 series, but uh, oftentimes the impact of that, of a, a brain injury, is going to be lack of concentration, lack of focus. When you've got a lot of things going on, that adds to it. Not to mention maybe being triggered in the classroom as well because they're doing some construction outside and you're supposed to be paying attention to what's happening but you just keep hearing something that makes you think of this one horrible night or whatever that might be. So that lack of concentration can come up as well. Triggers. I walked right into that one, didn't I? So having construction happening, having uh, triggers or something that comes up, they can be smells. They can be sights, sounds, anything that comes up that all of a sudden, now I feel exactly like I did when it happened. A classic for our Vietnam veterans is here in the Pacific Northwest as we get into the rain has started and set in. Just the weather can be reminiscent of a time for them that was difficult and can be a trigger for them, which can, can be something that they're most of the time, unless they've come and spent a good amount of time with me, they're not aware that it is even happening. Mandy, where do veterans typically position themselves in the classroom? Yes, most all of the time they're going to be in the back or where they can see the door. One of the worst things is to <laughs> be somewhere and have somebody coming up behind you and having no idea what that is. So oftentimes, most You'll see uh, at restaurants is a really good example. They'll want to be most visible where they can see people coming and going and don't feel like people can enter. So this room is quite a quagmire of <laughs> where to sit and where to be because you don't really want to be up here because you need to be by the exit. But if you're sitting in the back row, you're the most vulnerable. So uh, it's, it's a little bit about that configuration and, and ensuring that you have visibility of how to get out, but also who's coming and what dangers might be coming. Uh, poor coping skills. This again goes back to kind of the military training, which I'll talk about more in my next slide. But oftentimes, coping skills are not our biggest strengths as veterans. We oftentimes uh, worry about ignoring what's happening and just moving forward, just getting through and doing what we can. And uh, coping skills as far as slowing down, taking a breath, uh, weighing our options, not always, not always the best uh, choice that we go to. I know for me, uh, I was in the Army for five and a half years and one of my favorite uh, things in my officer basic course was we were at this little I think it was an obstacle course of some kind, and they they were saying like, well, you you have to make a choice. You have five minutes to evaluate the situation, come up with a plan, and execute. And the only wrong answer is to not have an answer. That's the only wrong answer, which means taking your time equals danger and bad things happening. So often, taking a breath and taking time and and realizing we have that extra time, at least for me personally, I really, boy, it catches me every time. So we'll go ahead. And I think these, I have them going in like one at a time. Yeah, because I like them to fly in. <laughs> so mission first. I mentioned this a little bit, but one of the things that the military is so focused on is the mission. If we're in the same unit, we have the same mission. Oftentimes, we're in the same military, we have the same mission. It's your army, it's my army, it's the same mission. And that works out great when you're working in a setting where everybody has the same purpose, the same reason for being there. But oftentimes, when you go to a new workplace, especially a civilian workplace, and I'm just going to throw out Subway, I like Subway. I'm not going to say I like them, but I'm just saying you go to Subway and your mission there is to make sandwiches and make them quickly and the customers like them and oftentimes that's not how everybody working at Subway feels about Subway. And <laughs> I'm sure you've seen it in the classroom as well where our mission is we've got to get these assignments done 
we, you have to do the work, you have to do this work, you have to do that work, and then we have to come together. Well, wait a minute. Now we're coming together, and you didn't do your part, you didn't your, do your part, and I don't have, I don't have any authority. We're the same. And I don't have a stripe above you, or two weeks over you, or anything that the military has. And so what am I supposed to do because you didn't do your part? And man, man, is that a struggle. Hypervigilance. So the beauty of hypervigilance is that if you're in a combat zone, and you need to know what's happening all around you, that keeps you alive. You are safe because you know who just came in that door. You know what's happening outside, which leads right back to that kind of lack of focus and lack of concentration. It's not so much that they're not focusing on the classroom, it's that it's really hard to pay attention to 25, 30 other people in the room and also know who's coming and going outside the room, especially if there's windows and doors. But that will save you. That will absolutely save you in the military. But what we find is that you move that into the classroom, and all of a sudden, my hypervigilance that keeps me alive in combat is distracting, and now I don't know what happened. And I was supposed to be taking notes, but somebody back there made some kind of comment that makes me concerned about what's happening and then I heard a noise out the door that somebody left and I wonder if there's something dangerous over there and now I've lost the last five minutes of what happened. And now I'm frustrated and now I don't know what to do so I'm just done. And that's kind of one of those often things where hypervigilance will keep you alive. It's wonderful. But even in a social sit setting where you're trying to have a conversation with your friends at a restaurant, it doesn't work so well because you know that that couple's fighting and that guy seems slightly dangerous to you and I can't see the door. So I have no idea what my friends and family just said. So that's a perfect example of hypervigilance and how that works and doesn't work. And emotional numbing. I talked about this a little bit before, but it's such a, such a big one that uh, oftentimes when you're out of the combat situation, all of these emotions come in and you don't even, I mean, what are these things? I was supposed to ignore everything that was happening and if I felt helpless or vulnerable, that didn't matter because I was pissed and I was gonna keep going and I was gonna do my mission. But now I don't have that mission and I can't be pissed and keep going because then I keep getting fired or kicked out of things or those kinds of things happen. So. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it. So instead of having the emotion, I'm going to squish it down with alcohol. That's the first place to start. That's a really good place to start. I'll do alcohol and then some other drugs and those kinds of things come up. And so oftentimes doing anything that can help those emotions from being center stage will come up. And so I by no means say that all veterans misuse substances, but oftentimes as a way to cope with all these emotions coming up, numbing them out feels way better than actually dealing with them. So that comes up for sure. Catastrophic thinking. This is again much like hypervigilance where the catastrophic thinking in the war zone will save lives. Because if I am out on a convoy I'm going to be going, okay, that is a choke point, that's a dangerous area. If we go around this way, oh, we can blow up there, or we blew up there last time, so we're going to go around and go this way, because I'm always going to be thinking of, if, this, if I do this, we could die. If I make this choice, we could die. And that works well, because then I make my choices based on that, and hopefully choose the ones that we don't, and then we live, and I think, see, this kind of thinking saves my life. It's wonderful. But then when you go home and you're at the grocery store or you're in the classroom and you're thinking about, well, no, well, I haven't got this paper done and I still need another two and a half hours to do it and there's no way I'm going to get it done and I just can't, so I'm going to fail this one project. But then because I got such a poor grade and I failed this one project, then I'm probably going to get a poor grade in the class and then I'm just going to fail the whole class. And so then I'm going to fail everything, so I might as well just stop and, and be done rather than fail the whole thing. And it's easy where that thought pattern of, 
the worst case scenario can kind of drive us. So again, I'm using extreme examples here, but this is exactly kind of what catastrophic thinking does, where it's really powerful and meaningful and a good, good thing in the combat zone, but boy, it can really get you in other places in life. Maybe, can I just interject? This is a perfect place to do this. So uh, right now I'm speaking to the faculty people primarily, but you know, typically if you're sitting there talking to a student, they're, they're like bombing the class. You know, typically, if the student's bombing the class, your advice is going to be, hey, you need to take a W press. That's not typically the best strategy for a veteran because when they're using their GI benefits, if they withdraw, then they, they've just lost money and um, livelihood in terms of supporting their family. The, the VA will pay for them to repeat a class a second time. So if, if you're counseling, that, tell them, work it through, and then sign up for this class at the beginning next term. As long as you, you only take it twice, the VA will pay for it. So again, that's that's a little bit different than kind of the guidance you would give a typical student. Yeah, great point, too. 